Okay, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This has been our theme verse, our theme statement really for this whole series as we've been going through uh, looking at the great doctrines of the church. We see that the church belongs to Jesus. It doesn't belong to humanity. It belongs to Christ. It, uh, he owns the church because he purchased it. He, uh, Ephesians 5 tells us he purchased the church with his own blood. And Jesus is building his church. He has been building his church and he continues to build his church. He has never stopped building his church. Today, Jesus is building his church. That's why you are here today, because Christ is building his church. I want to start today by looking again at our definition of what makes a church a church. We laid this out for you probably in the second or third week. We said a church is a group of believers, a gathering of believers under the care of biblically qualified leadership who gather in the name of Christ to worship Jesus as king, to hear God's word faithfully preached, and to participate in the sacraments. Where these th three things are happening, where a group of people are, are gathering in the name of Christ to worship him, to hear his word, and to partake of the sacraments, a church is being built, a church is being formed right in that place. And so today we're going to look at this last, uh, the, this third uh, requirement for a church, and that is the administration of the sacraments or the ordinances as they are sometimes called. Uh, some people draw a distinction between those two terms, sacraments and ordinances. Uh, they essentially mean the same thing, and, and so I'll, I use them interchangeably. So we're going to look at them, the, the two sacraments of the church, of baptism and communion. Baptism and communion. Now these are two things that were designed by Christ to unite the church. But historically this has been something that the church has divided over uh, throughout the centuries. And uh, there are many questions and debates that arise as soon as we start talking about baptism and communion. Why do we do it? What does it mean? What does it accomplish? Who should participate? How often should we participate? And on and on and on and on the questions go. And as we've seen in this series from beginning to end, when we have questions on these things, we don't turn to culture. We don't turn to our traditions. We turn where? To the Word of God. It's the Word of God that is our final authority on all of these matters. And so today we're going to turn to the Word of God. We're going to see what it has to say about baptism and communion. And today's going to be a quick overview. I'm not going to be able to go in depth, but hopefully after today you'll have a, a sort of 20,000 foot understanding, a view of both baptism and communion. We have a lot of ground to cover today. You know, I missed last week. Um, you know, how many of you like a, when you get a, a great deal on something? Don't you just love getting a good deal? I love getting a good deal. Don't you love those deals that are two for one? Don't you love those two for one deals? Today you're getting a two-for-one deal, okay? So <laughs> I missed last week. We're, we're, I'm, I'm trying to finish this series this month before next month because I'm going to be going on a, a vacation a little bit next month. And so I'm trying to wrap this up. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. We're going to go really quickly this morning. So I, I, I stay, stay tuned in. Stay paying attention. We're going to go through a lot of material, but I know it's going to be meaningful for you. Uh, my aim today is first and foremost always to be faithful to Scripture but in addition to that, I want to broaden your understanding. I want your, your experience of, of if you haven't been baptized, when you are baptized, I want that experience to be enriched. And also for all of us as we take communion, I, I want that experience to be uh, enriched as well. And I want to deepen your walk and fellowship with God. So that is, that is the goal. That is the aim that I'm shooting for today. Now before we move much further, we have to ask ourselves this question. How are we saved? How are we saved? Well, the Bible says, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, that by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
How are we saved? How do we receive salvation? What is the means by which we are cleansed from sin? The grace of God. We are saved by the grace of God. This was one of the, the five solas of the Reformation. By grace alone are you saved. Not a result of works. We don't earn our salvation. There is nothing that we do that contributes to our salvation, our justification, where God would declare us just, justified, declare us righteous. It is only through the unmerited favor, the grace of God. That's what grace means, unmerited favor. That means you didn't earn it. Paul says if it was a result of works, then we would have something to boast in, wouldn't we? But we have nothing to boast in except the cross of Jesus Christ. That's all we have to boast in. Our salvation is not something that we do. It's not something that we come to God and, and we clean ourselves up. We can't clean ourselves up. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. If we try to clean ourselves up, we would just be smearing ourselves more with sin and pride and legalism. It's only the grace of God that God from eternity past looked down the corridor of time and he has called his people out throughout the centuries to be a part of his family through the preaching of the gospel, the spirit moving in our hearts and our lives. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God made us alive together in Christ Jesus. By grace you have been saved. How do we receive this grace? By faith. By trusting in God. By trusting in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. By not trusting in our own works, but trusting in his finished work. As he hung on that cross and said, it is finished. The price for sin paid in full. There's nothing that we add to the finished work of Christ. The moment we try to add to the finished work of Christ, the moment we begin to put our faith in something else other than the finished work of Christ. So what we have to establish is that the sacraments are not. What are they not? Before we can understand what they are, we need to understand what they are not. And so on this, there are two really extreme views on, on opposite ends of a spectrum that are incompatible with, this, with what the uh, scriptures teach. And so you have an, an extreme view on one end and an extreme view on the other end. And, and neither one of those is correct. And so we're going to look at what they are not, and then we're going to look at what they are. And the first thing that we have to establish is that baptism and communion are not meritous works that impart salvation. They are not meritous works that impart salvation. I am not saved by baptism. I am not saved through receiving communion. Amen. Well, why? Because what am I saved by? The grace of God, the finished work of Christ, the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. Now, this is one of the major distinctions between the Protestant church and the Roman Catholic church. Because the Roman Catholic Church does teach that baptism and communion are meritous works that impart salvation. That's the one end of the spectrum. Now because we live in San Antonio, a city founded by Roman Catholic missionaries, a city that continues to have a huge Roman Catholic presence, I feel obligated to contrast what we see in Scripture over against what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. Well, it's going to upset some of you today. I'm sorry. But hear me clearly. I have no issues with Roman Catholics. I have no issues with Roman Catholics. I have issues with what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. Now, do you understand there's a distinction there? There's a distinction there. Their doctrine distorts, obfuscates, perverts... The gospel. Now, I know these are strong words, but I'm going to back them up. And there are many precious believers, true believers in Christ within the Catholic Church. But if there are true believers in the Roman Catholic Church, hear me clearly, it is in spite of what the church teaches, not because of it. 
I'm going to quote to you from the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent was from uh, 1545 to 1563. Uh, this Council of Roman Catholic Bishops met in response to the Reformation. The Reformation led by Martin Luther, John Calvin, and many others. In response to the Reformers, the Protestant Reformation, the Council of Trent formed... And they had met these Roman Catholic bishops 18 different times and pronounced uh, certain decrees about the Catholic Church. And in many ways, the, the Council of Trent was a counter-reformation. And so let me, let me share with you some of what they declared. Again, this is the official position of the Roman Catholic Church. This is not hearsay. This is not what critics have to say. This is their own words and their own teachings. In the sixth session, the council issued a decree saying, listen, if anyone says that the justice received, that's justification received, is not preserved and also increased before God through good works, but that he says that works are merely the fruits of the signs of justification obtained, but not a cause of the increase thereof, let him be anathema. That word anathema means eternally damned. That's what that word means. In the seventh session, they said, If anyone saith that the sacraments of the new law are not necessary unto salvation, and that without them men obtain of God through faith alone the grace of justification... Let him be anathema. Seventh session, decree. If anyone says that by the sacraments of the new law, grace is not conferred through the act performed, but that faith alone in the divine promise suffices for the obtaining of grace, let him be anathema. Again, eternally damned. If one says that baptism is not necessary unto salvation, let him be anathema. Now I could go on and on and on. The point is that Rome teaches a doctrine of works-based salvation. That you must participate in baptism and communion to be saved. They have never recanted from this position. In fact, it was reaffirmed as recently as the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which was written in 1992, and the Second Vatican Council, which met from 1962 to 1965. This is the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. It denies salvation through grace and faith alone. They teach salvation through Christ's work along with your own meritous works. And you participate in that work through baptism and the Mass or the Eucharist. And these are those meritous works. They teach that you are spiritually reborn, not by faith, but through water baptism. And that baptism is a means by which the church bestows saving grace. Likewise, when it comes to communion, they teach something called transubstantiation which means the conversion of the substance. They teach that the priest, as he uh, prepares the Mass, that he calls Christ down off of his throne in heaven and, and orders him to be physically present in the bread and in the juice, transferring the bread and juice into the literal, physical body and blood of Christ, that that priest then breaks and sacrifices on that altar... ...as a propitiation, as a, as a, uh, a, a sin offering, as a, a, an offering to cleanse those there of sin. He's offering another sacrifice. The elements literally converted into the body and blood of Christ. Literally offered as a blood sacrifice on that altar. And that you must partake of this literal body and blood to have your sins forgiven... And so according to Rome, there is a real priest offering a real sacrifice on a real altar for the forgiveness of the sins of those who are present. And that if you do not partake of the Mass as administered by a Catholic priest, you are anathema. You are eternally damned. This is the teaching of Rome. 
You might say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, everything and the Bible. So let's look at a little bit of what the Word of God says, shall we? Hebrews 7, 27. Jesus has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily. For he, for, for he, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself up. Once for all sacrifice. Not a daily sacrifice. Not a weekly sacrifice. A once for all sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 9, when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by the means of blood, the blood of bulls and goats, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Entered in, made a sacrifice once for all. Hebrews 10, 10 through 14. And by that we will receive what has been sacrificed through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins... He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The, the, the case for the once for all sacrifice on Christ, it is a closed case. There is not another sacrifice to be made. There is not another priest that needs to offer a sacrifice again. Christ today is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he is not getting up off that throne until all of his enemies have been made a footstool and he returns to this earth to establish his kingdom world without end. Amen. He is not daily being summoned off of his throne to appear again in the bread and the wine, to suffer again over and over and over and over again throughout all eternity. No, he suffered once and for all. All of the sin of the world laid upon him in that moment, the Bible says. And of course, Jesus declared, it is finished. It is finished. The teaching of the Roman Catholic Church is a works-based salvation. It is Jesus plus something. They teach that Christ's atoning sacrifice is insufficient to save sinners. They teach that it is not finished. I want to make this clear for you. Again, I love Roman Catholic people. Many of you have Catholic family members. The issue is not with them. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces. And the official teaching of the doctrine of Rome, it is a false teaching with a false system, with a false priesthood, with a false altar and a false sacrifice. And if you put your faith in that gospel, it is not the gospel of the Bible. It is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not talking about secondary issues here. These are central to the heart of the gospel. If you believe the gospel of Rome, you do not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't say that lightly but with much fear and trembling. And so I say all of that to say that baptism and communion do not add anything to your justification. They do not make you more righteous. 
The Bible says that we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ today, right now. We are clothed in his righteousness. How can I be made more righteous than to be clothed in his righteousness? Participation in these things do not add to our justification. They are not meritorious works that we perform that earn for us the grace of God. They do not impart grace apart from faith. Because we are saved by grace through faith, not a result of works. So that's one end of the spectrum. Meritous works that impart grace. There's another end of the spectrum. And that is that the the sacraments are purely symbolic. Purely symbolic. And that there is no spiritual benefit whatsoever. This is the, the, the belief that many Protestants have. It's the other end of the spectrum. And it's a response to the heretical view of the Catholic Church. And so there's this one end of the spectrum that says it's through uh, the sacraments that you earn your salvation. And, and in response to that, the, the pendulum has swung all the way to the other side where they say, no, it does nothing for you. There's no spiritual benefit whatsoever. It's purely symbolic. That's the other end of the spectrum. And, and that's not true either. That's not true either. The truth is somewhere in the middle. It doesn't earn you salvation, but it also, it it does do something for you. It it, it is of spiritual benefit to be water baptized. It is of spiritual benefit to partake in communion. It is a blessing and, and, and important to your spiritual life. And walk with the Lord. And so we can't say on the one hand that, that it's, it earns our salvation. The scripture is very clear on that. But the scripture is also clear that God does work in our lives as we participate in these things. He does some work in our lives through them. Not a saving work, but it's part of a sanctification work. It's part of our fellowship with him. There is a spiritual thing that Christ does in our lives through our participation in them. And so we want to make sure that we don't fall into either one of these ditches on either side of the road, but that the truth is somewhere in the middle. Now, this is where people just get into all kinds of trouble because they start to get into arguments and start to get into debates. And the truth is that the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about what it is that these things accomplish for us. It doesn't tell us a lot about it. It simply asks us to participate and to participate in faith. And so then in the absence of that, there's been a lot of people who've tried to come in and said, well, it does this for you and it does that for you and and you can take communion to be healed and this, that and the other and people start to argue and debate about it. And we need to just be content to let the scripture say what it says and receive it by faith. And not try and just fill it in with our own traditions, fill it in with our own best thinking or God told me this. Let's just be content with what the word of God says and receive it by faith. Amen. So why do we baptize and why do we take communion? There's three reasons. The first is really the only reason that we need. There's two other reasons. But the first is it's an obedience to the Lord. Amen? Can we just say that's the only reason we really need because Jesus told us to do it? In Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, Jesus said, This is my body which is broken for you. This is the blood of the new covenant. Take this and do it in remembrance of me. In Matthew 28, we've been looking at that, the Great Commission. Jesus commanded his apostles to go into all the world, to preach the gospel to every nation, to disciple the nations, and to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so the first reason that we take communion and that we participate in baptism is in obedience to the Lord Jesus. The second reason is the apostolic example. As we get into the book of Acts, what do we see that they do? Well, they did what the Lord Jesus said. And so we, of course, obey the Lord Jesus, but we can also look to the example of the apostles that was handed down to us. And they, in the book of Acts, participate in the Lord's Supper, and they, of course, baptize in the name of Jesus. And then into uh, the third reason is as we follow the example that we have from church history. Church history tells us we can learn a lot from church history. 
And the example from church history is that this is something that the church has always done. Following the, in obedience to the Lord Jesus, following the apostolic example, and of course now we, 2,000 years later, follow in the example of also church history. So this is why we do this. It's an obedience to the Lord. Now let's talk a little bit about baptism, the meaning of baptism. Baptism is a symbolic ceremony of your union with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Romans 6, 3, and 4 says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Colossians 2.12 says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through the faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. It's a symbolic ceremony of our union with Christ. It very clearly symbolizes the death to the old life as we are plunged beneath the water. Death to the old life, just as de Jesus died and, and was buried. So we are plunged beneath the water. And just as Christ was risen from the dead on the third day, we are now raised out of the water to newness of life. Our old life of sin, our old life of shame, our own life of, of rebellion against God, that is dead and buried with Christ. As we come up out of that water, we are declaring I am a new creation. I have new life. I have eternal life in Jesus Christ. In baptism, you publicly identify yourself with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus died and was buried and rose again on the third day, so you too have died to your own life and have received eternal life through Jesus of course, the water also symbolizes the washing clean of sin. Baptism is the, decis the, the decisive, visible entry point into the kingdom of God. It, it signifies that you have put your faith in Christ. It doesn't bestow faith upon you. It doesn't bestow grace upon you. But after you have come to faith in Jesus, your next step is to be water baptized. And it is this visible sign that you have been transferred from sin to faith, from darkness to light, transferred from Adam into Christ, transferred into the kingdom of God. The last words of Christ were to go into all the world and to baptize the nations. And Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost and he, the, the, he preaches Christ and, and the, the people are convicted of their sin after he preaches the gospel. And they say to him, what shall we do? And Peter says to them, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And so the last words of Christ and the first words of the apostles are repent, believe, and be baptized. And so we begin our discipleship with water baptism. Baptism is the moment that discipleship begins. It's your first step of discipleship. Your, your first step into the water is your first step of being a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. If you have not been baptized, you are not following Jesus. Jesus said to be baptized. Baptism is, baptism is not necessary for salvation, but it is necessary to follow Jesus. The clearest case that baptism is not necessary for salvation is, of course, Jesus on the cross. Jesus on the cross was crucified between two thieves. On one side, the one thief was mocking Jesus, making fun of him. If you're the son of God, call down some angels, get us some help. The other side... The thief said, we're up here justly because of what we have done. Here Christ is suffering unjustly. This man is suffering injustice as he hangs here on the cross. We're getting what we deserve, but he's getting what he doesn't deserve. And that thief turned to Jesus and he said, remember me 
when you come into your kingdom. He had put his faith in Christ on the cross. And Jesus looked to him and said, I just wish we had some water and I could baptize you here. I'm sorry. You are anathema. I'm sorry. No, what did he say? Today you will be with me in paradise. If the thief on the cross can, with his faith alone in Christ, be ushered into the kingdom of God, so can all of you. However, to follow Christ, we must be baptized. To follow Christ, to be a disciple of Christ. Again, not necessary for salvation, but yes, necessary for sanctification and for discipleship. So who should be baptized? That's the next great debate. At Destiny Church, we have always practiced what's called credo baptism or believer's baptism. That's contrasted against what's called pedo baptism or infant baptism. There is significant evidence in the New Testament and acts for believer's baptism. That's baptizing those who have put their faith in Christ. Acts 2.41, those who received Philip's word or, or Peter's word were baptized. Those who believed were baptized. Acts 8.12, when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. In Acts chapter 10, Peter ministers to Cornelius as Peter is preaching the gospel to him. The Holy Spirit falls on them. They begin to speak in other tongues, filled with the Spirit. Before Peter even gave the altar call, they were filled with the Spirit, this incredible miracle. And so Peter, upon seeing them baptized in the Spirit, he says, Can anyone withhold water baptism from these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And so we see in the New Testament that those who are baptized are those who have made a profession of faith, those who have come to faith in Christ. It's not through baptism that you receive faith, but you receive baptism because you have put your faith in Jesus. In the New Testament, we don't see any evidence of anyone receiving baptism who isn't first a believer. And I do want to draw a distinction between uh, Protestant denominations that practice infant baptism and uh, the Catholic Church, which practices infant baptism. Uh, Protestant denominations like Lutherans, Presbyterians, they view infant baptism more along the lines that we view baby dedication. It's, a, it's, a, um, it's an ag acknowledgement that, that this is a child that's being raised in a, a family that's part of God's covenant family. That's how they view baptism. So Protestants, uh, again, Lutherans, Presbyterians, they view baptism not as imparting grace, but as a dedication to, again, raise that child in the ways of God, that that child is part of God's covenant family. The Roman Catholic Church teaches, again, that baptism imparts grace, that water baptism cleanses you of original sin. And so even though they both practice water baptism, what they mean in it is very different. And I think it's important that we understand that distinction. Nevertheless, at Destiny Church, we practice believer's baptism. We, we think that this is the most faithful to the, um, what the, the teaching of Scripture is. However, I have many good Presbyterian friends and Lutheran friends, and I don't argue and debate about this with them because they don't see it as imparting grace to the infant. Does that make sense? Is anybody still awake today? Okay. <laughs> there, okay, great. So then the question arises, what age is appropriate for water baptism? Well, we leave that up to the parents. We leave that up to the parents. But I will say, I don't think there's any harm in waiting until you are certain that your child has truly come to faith in Christ. I don't think there's any harm whatsoever. I was baptized at the age of seven. And um, I remember it. I remember I had faith in Christ. I remember I had a, a desire to do it. I remember sitting down with my grandpa in his office and he asked me some questions. And I guess I gave him the right answers. And so uh, he baptized me. Um, I will also tell you that I was somewhat motivated by all my friends that were getting baptized that week at the end of VBS as well. So... Um, 
but it, it, it took, I guess. No, I'm just joking. I'm joking. That's a joke. That's a joke. That's a joke. But I, I don't think that there's any harm in, in waiting until a child has an earnest desire and a, a true understanding. Now, do I understand more about God today than I did at seven years old? Of course I do. Do I understand more about love and marriage than the day I got married today? Of course I do. That doesn't preclude someone from who doesn't have a perfect knowledge of all theological things from being baptized. But they should, I think, demonstrate a genuine faith and a genuine understanding of the work of Christ and the gospel. And so, parents, we leave that up to you. If your child desires to be baptized, we have some material that you can work through with them and that can help you understand if they are ready. And if they are, great. We will baptize them and we will celebrate their faith in Christ. Now, how often should someone be baptized? I would say once is a, is a good amount. Um, but if you were baptized as a child and never lived for Christ and have, and have now come to faith in Christ, you know, if you were baptized as a child and there was never ever any evidence that you ever had faith, but yet now you have come to faith, I think it is appropriate if the Lord puts the desire on your heart to be baptized again. I don't see anything wrong with that. But I also don't see the need to, you know, run the baptism tank every week and just because you had a bad week of sin, we don't come and rebaptize you again, you know. It's like marriage. You get married one time. You say your vows one time. You don't have to repeat your vows every day to stay married. But, but baptism is like those marriage vows. It is. I am, I am making a commitment. I'm, I'm a follower of Christ from here on out. My, the, my life is of, of sin and shame is over. I'm following Christ. Um, there's going to be good days, there's going to be bad days, but he, he is who I'm following from this day forward. That's what baptism is all about. Now, uh, at, at some point I had asked you to open to 1 Corinthians 11. Do you remember that? And I told you we'd look at that at the end. Remember that? So we've arrived. This is the first end today. Um, 1 Corinthians 11, we're going to look a little bit here quickly at communion. We're entering into the bonus round. This is the two for one, okay? The Corinthian church had lots of problems. Lots of problems. And one of their problems was divisions within the church. Factions within the church. And those factions were being expressed when people were taking of the Lord's Supper, when they were taking of communion. And so in verse 17, Paul's rebuking them for their abuse of communion. He says, in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. He says, you guys are messing it up so bad, it might be better if you just stopped. Because it's not for the good that you come together, it's actually for the worse. He says, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. And he says, I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you are eating. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal, while another one goes hungry, and another one gets drunk. What? What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do, you not, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Their expression of the Lord's Supper was a little bit different than what we do. They were, they were practicing a whole meal. And they weren't sharing with one another. It wasn't potluck style. It was... I'm bringing what's for me and my family and nobody else is getting anything. And so there were wealthy people who came and brought all of this stuff, but they wouldn't share it with the people who were poor in the church. Some people were indulging so much on the communion wine, they were getting drunk. 
That's why we just have those little cups here. We, we figured out how to solve that problem. They were getting drunk. Well, they're not sharing with anybody else. Paul says, what are you doing? Don't you have houses that you can do this in? This is not the way to take the Lord's Supper. Verse 23, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when it was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As, as we participate in communion, it's part of how we share and preach the gospel. Our participation in communion proclaims the death of the Lord. It makes this invisible faith that we have, it makes it visible and tangible. Verse 27, he says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. This is serious stuff. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About other things, I will give directions when I come. So this is a serious matter. This is, communion is not something that we do casually, flippantly. It's not something we just do as a ritual. It's something that we enter into soberly. That we, he says, examine ourselves. That we, we take time before we partake. And it's a moment of reflection with the Lord where we, we, we examine our heart, we examine our lives. We ask the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin. We say, Lord, is there anything in my life that is unpleasing to you? If so, I repent of my sin. I, I, I lean on your word. I trust in, in, in your forgiveness. I I trust in your word that says if I confess my sin, you are faithful and just to forgive my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. This is something that we should do every time before we take of communion. A moment of self-examination, a moment of self-reflection. He also says if we don't um, discern the body properly, that we, we eat and drink judgment on ourselves. What this means by discerning the body is that there was, again, factions, rivalries, arguments happening within the church. Paul says, Be before you go to the table, you, you need to settle those things. You, you need to not let these things, these issues, fester in the body of Christ. We need to preserve the unity within the church. And participation in the Lord's Supper is part of how we preserve that unity as we seek forgiveness, as we seek restoration and reconciliation with one another before we partake of the Lord's table. And so this, this process of examination, of conviction of sin, of repentance, of restored fellowship, it's something that should be a part of our lives as we partake of communion. Communion reminds us of some, of some things. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. It reminds us of Christ's death his atoning work, his sufficient sacrifice that has cleansed us of sin. We're also reminded of Christ who has risen from the dead, the new life that we have, that Jesus is not eternally suffering on the cross, but that he is risen and ascended to the right hand of the Father. 
It, it shows us through our, our participation in communion that we are participating in the benefits of Christ's death. As we reach out individually and, and take of the cup and take of the bread, bring them to ourselves, each one of us is reminded that, and, and by that action we proclaim, I am taking the benefits of Christ's death to myself. It reminds us that Christ is our source of spiritual nourishment. Of spiritual nourishment. That we do feed on Christ. Jesus says, abide in me and you will bear much fruit. That we derive our spiritual nourishment from him. Jesus says, without me you can do nothing. And as we partake of this, we proclaim our dependence upon Christ for our spiritual nourishment. The, the communion table reminds us of the unity that should exist among all believers as we approach the same table, rich and poor, male and female, white, black, brown, from this side of town, from that side of town, we all come to the same table, to the table of the Lord, the unity of believers. There's not one table reserved for the rich and wealthy and another table reserved for the poor. It's this great expression of the unity that we have with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And of course, we remember that Christ's sacrifice was sufficient and that it is finished and that the work is paid in full. Communion reminds us of that. And it reminds us of our assurance of salvation. Our assurance of salvation. You know, one of the things that really breaks my heart um, as I have over the years ministered to, to Catholics is the lack of assurance of salvation that they have. There's a real lack of assurance of salvation because they never know how much work they have to do to be saved. They never know how much, how much communion do I have to take? How many prayers do I have to pray? How many rosaries do I have to do? How many Hail Marys do I have to pray? How many confessions do I have to go to? Is, is it enough? And many Catholic believers, true believers that I've had the privilege of ministering to, they have no assurance of salvation because they're, they're muddled with all of this theology of, of their own works. But as we come to the table, we come in faith with full assurance of salvation that Christ has cleansed us of sin, that we are his children, and that we are a part of his covenant family. Now, how often should we partake of communion? Well, I said baptism is a thing that we do one time. Thank the Lord, otherwise we'd have to all bring towels every Sunday. That would that'd be quite a situation if we all had to be baptized every Sunday. How often should we partake of communion? Well, I've known churches that partake of communion once a year. They have an annual communion service. Historically, at Destiny, we've done it once a month. I've known some churches that do it quarterly. And then, of course, we know some churches do it every week. Does the Bible have anything to say about that? Well, it turns out that it does. In Acts chapter 20, it appears that the church that gathers, as they gather every week, that they gather and they take communion together. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And again, several times in this passage that we read in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, when you come together, when you gather, when you gather, when you gather. And so the, the biblical evidence of the New Testament church is that they partook of the Lord's Supper weekly as they came together on the Lord's Day to worship the Lord. And so I know historically we have been a once-a-month church, uh, but really as I've been convicted of, of the meaning of communion and, and repentance of sin and restored fellowship with God... At Destiny, we're going to start taking the Lord's Supper weekly as part of our weekly worship gathering. So, We 
We're going to make time to do it every week. And I know that for, for some that there may be some concerns that, um, you know, if we, if we take it every week, it'll make it less special. The less often you take it, it makes it more special. And I just want to say, for whatever reason, if you feel comfortable taking it once a month, you can continue to take it once a month on the first Sunday of the month. There's nothing prohibiting you from doing that. We're not forcing this on anybody, but I do feel led to give everybody the opportunity to partake and to participate as much as they feel led to do so. Again, you're under no obligation uh, to partake every week, but we simply want to make it available. And I, I think that as we do do this, that it will be meaningful for you. Now, who should partake of communion? Believers in Jesus. Believers in Jesus. If you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, if you don't have faith in Jesus, do not take of communion. The Bible was very clear that if you're not a believer, if uh, you haven't examined yourself rightly, that it, you put yourself in a very dangerous place. And so, as a, as a pastor, I want to warn you, do not take of communion. Now, some churches only serve communion to those who are official members of the church, and that's how they, uh, how they do that. That's called fencing the table. But at Destiny, we feel content to fence the table by opening it up to all who have put their faith in Christ and warning those who have not put their faith in Christ to not participate. And so we do put a little bit of a fence around the table. It's not a wall, right? There's a gate. It's easy to go in and out of. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you have faith in Jesus, you're welcome to participate, even if you're not an official member of the church. But if you don't have faith in Jesus, if you're not yet a Christian, uh, don't participate uh, in communion. Now, we're going to be doing this at the end of the sermons. That's where we're going to do it. And we're doing it here because we think that this will be a good place if the Holy Spirit has moved in your heart through the preaching of the Word of God. It's a wonderful time to, uh, if there is sin in your life, to confess that sin before God, to repent of that sin, to ask the Holy Spirit's help in your life, and then to partake of communion and have renewed fellowship with God. Our goal is not to stop you from participating, but our goal is to help you walk in fellowship and communion with God. And so we want to encourage everyone to examine their hearts, to confess their sin, to repent of sin, and to walk in fellowship, renewed fellowship with God through communion. So I'm going to invite our worship team uh, to come and our ushers to get ready. Through gathering in Christ's name and participating in baptism and communion, we make the invisible kingdom of God visible. The kingdom of God is among us. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is here right now. Christ's rule and Christ's reign in our hearts and in our gathering together. Jesus works in our life through communion and baptism I can't tell you exactly how it works or exactly what Christ does in our life through it, but I can tell you that it does work and that Jesus does work in our lives as we participate in it. Again, it's not a saving work. Communion is a, uh, uh, not purely memorial either. There is a benefit spiritually to taking of communion and participating in baptism. And as we do this, the saving work of Christ is brought into greater focus in our lives. Our union with Christ is expressed in a tangible way. Our love for Christ grows deeper as we remember his sacrifice. And our devotion to Christ grows stronger as we walk in obedience to him. I'm going to invite you to stand and... I'm going to give you just a few more instructions. 
as we begin to do this weekly, we do have some ushers here who are going to guide you on, on uh, the, the flow of traffic. I, I think that the, the more we do this, we'll, we'll learn this traffic pattern and, and uh, we'll, we'll flow into that more easily. But as we start to do this weekly, we're going to do it a little bit differently. In the past, what we've done is after everybody gets their elements, uh, me or somebody else has come back up and said, let's all take of the cracker together and let's all take of the juice together or let's try and figure out how we can open our, our prepackaged communion together. Um, we're not going to continue to do it that way. The worship team is going to lead us in a few more songs of worship. And as they do, you're invited to go to the table to take your elements, to bring them back to your seat. And while you're there, it's a time for you to worship the Lord. It's a time for you to pray. It's a time for you to have that reflection and, and uh, moment with the Lord. And then for you to just partake. There's not going to be somebody that comes back up and says, let's take it together. You yourself, as you pray and worship the Lord, you'll take it there at your seat uh, when you feel well and ready. I would also say that for married couples and even those who have children that are believers, uh, fathers and mothers, th this is a time where you can come together and, and pray together with one another and then receive that together there as a family. And so we're not going to be waiting uh, to all get back to our seats and, and I'm not going to come back up and say, let's all take it together. You'll go, you'll take your elements, you'll come back to your seat. We'll continue to worship the Lord, a few more songs of worship. And then when you're ready, you go ahead and take it there at your seat. Does that make sense? All right. Father, we thank you for your word. It is a lamp to our feet, a light unto our path. Lord, I pray that as we uh, embark, Lord, into this new season of remembering your death and resurrection on a weekly basis, that your presence and spirit would be felt here in a real and sweet and tangible way. We thank you, Lord, for your word that teaches us and instructs us. We do this now in obedience to your word. In Jesus' name. Amen.